my question to the Secret Service is, what were you doing with all these assets? What, these guys are just sitting around doing what? They were purposely held back from being afforded to travel with President Trump. How is it that an agency that's one of 23 agencies under the Department of Homeland Security can continually be afforded the courtesy of providing no answers, and in many cases, simply vague answers that make no sense, and yet the media is not up in arms about this? This is Just Asking Questions, a show for inquiring minds on reason. How well protected is Trump? I'm Zach Weissmuller, senior producer for Reason. Flying solo today, Liz Wolf will be back next week. On July 13th, Donald Trump became the first U.S. president to be shot in more than 40 years and the first to be shot during a campaign since 1912. Then, incredibly, the Secret Service stopped a second would-be assassin who was hiding in the bushes with a rifle on the perimeter of Trump's golf course as the president was just one hole away. Two unnervingly close calls in about two months. What's going on? Some Republican lawmakers say Trump is underprotected and accuse the Biden administration of politicizing the Secret Service to intentionally put the president in danger. Media reports say that Trump has made the Secret Service's job too difficult by insisting on golfing on short notice at unsecure locations. The Secret Service has said that it is understaffed. Today's guest will give us an insider's view of how the Secret Service works and what might have gone wrong. Richard Staropoli served as a special agent in the Secret Service for 25 years. He served briefly as the chief information officer for the Department of Homeland Security under the Trump administration and is now the senior managing director for Rivada, a telecommunications and satellite internet company. Richard, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, sir. Let me take you back to July 13th, a Sunday The news breaks that shots were fired at a Trump rally and Trump was injured, but alive and defiant. We could all remember where we were and how it felt. What was your reaction as a veteran of the Secret Service? My reaction was uh, one of uh, incredible um, lack of confidence in the Secret Service. And I looked at this and I'm like, how can this happen? You know, it seems that the entire world realized the threat level against President Trump and I would think that most of the world would have designated President Trump as, you know, probably the number one target in the world, considering what's been going on in the United States, if not the world, for the last four years, certainly since he's left office. Yet it seems that fact um, failed to reach the uh, Secret Service. Given the lack of protective assets and manpower that was afforded President Trump, uh, which is what ultimately led to uh, a 20-year-old kid with no real training whatsoever, allowed him to walk into an event site, get as close as 150 yards up on a rooftop. No no one challenged him at all. And apparently was able to get eight shots off, one of which actually hit the president. You know, leads you to question, how seriously did the U.S. Secret Service actually take the protection of President Trump? Hmm. Yeah. So what were, uh, we're talking about the shooting that occurred at, in Butler, Pennsylvania, yes. um, where Thomas Crux, the suspect climbed onto a roof and had what appeared to be a pretty clear line of sight to the former president. What were some of the biggest red flags or anomalies that immediately jumped out at you as more details emerged? Well, the biggest red flag is if you looked at any of the overhead shots that were taken of that event site, a tremendous crowd, which is not uncommon for President Trump, right? I think the number there was pegged somewhere around 15 to 17,000. You had a building that was in close enough proximity, although at the time we didn't know how close it was, uh, but it looked like it gave clear line of sight to the podium where President Trump would be speaking from. Why was that left uncovered? I didn't see anyone, let alone a Secret Service agent in a suit and tie. How about a uniformed cop? How about a photographer that was assigned to the state police? Somebody should have been on the roof of that building, yet it was left totally uncovered. And listen, at 150 yards, which is what we come to find out, you know, uh, post shooting, um, that that shot didn't take a professional assassin to hit President Trump. 
that was an easy enough shot, particularly given that type of weapon. That AR-15 is capable of firing out effectively to 650 yards. You know, so somebody up on a rooftop, even if it's only 10 feet high, with an AR-15 and a full magazine, um, you could sit there and hit that podium all day long without any training. Uh, and that's exactly what happened. Secondly, you know, where is the airborne asset? You know, the Secret yeah. Service has been using a helicopter surveillance platform, well, since Igor Sikorsky invented helicopters, right? That would have solved your entire communications problem and would have given the Secret Service an airborne opportunity to see what's going on. Um, consider this, if you will. If I was the site agent and I simply would have said to the state police, I need one of your helicopters, which I've never had declined by the state police in any of the states, and I've worked in 49 out of the 50 of them, have not been to Hawaii, Um the state police provide a helicopter, comes with two pilots, both of whom are with the state police. They've got full communication, not just with the state police, but the entire Pennsylvania 911 system. I put a Secret yeah. Service agent in the backseat of the helicopter. He's got full communications with the Secret Service. And I put a local maybe butler cop or local butler SWAT guy up there. Now I have full communications with all the entities involved at that site. I've got the ability to stay in the air. And I've got tremendous optics. These helicopters are equipped not just with uh, cameras that can see, you know, a dime from a thousand yards away, but they also have forward-looking infrared, thermal imaging, and the ability to publicly address people through use of a PA system. That would have solved, one, the communications problem. Apparently, that was broken down on the ground, as well as would have given me eyes in the sky and effectively increased my range as a site agent to see what's going on practically all over the entire county of Butler, let alone over that event site. And it simply wasn't done. And now we know today from the testimony that's been given, uh, that's been given out, um, as well as the report that was released early this morning uh, on the East Coast here, um, we know the Secret Service never requested that asset. Why that was done, huh, that remains any man's guess at this point. Yeah. On that first point, that that's the one yep. that I think jumped out to everyone, people yep. like me who have you know, no experience in protecting right. or providing security is it just seems obvious that there's this roof top that is, yep. you know, right across from the stage. This was a question that several senators put to yep. the acting Secret Service Director Ronald Rowe Jr., who uh, replaced uh, Kimberly Cheadle, who yep. stepped down, uh, uh, rightfully so, after this Ooh. happened. Um, and uh, we've got a clip of both uh, Senator Mike Lee and Josh, uh, Senator Josh Hawley yep. asking Roe about this issue of the roof and why no one, first of all, was on the roof. And then apparently this building uh, was mm -hmm. was supposed to be a post where people were posted and it was abandoned, according to at least a whistleblower report uh, or a, a whistleblower blow report that was sent to Senator Hawley. So let's run that clip of Hawley and Lee asking Roe about this. Okay. Do you know if someone was supposed to be on the roof? Do you know if someone was in fact, that's what the whistleblowers tells me that may or may not be accurate. Do you know that to be the fact? Was somebody posted to the roof, local law enforcement or whomever? Uh, I do not know that to be a fact. Well, can I ask you why you don't know that? Again, Senator... Don't we are looking at this and they should have been on that roof. And the fact that they were in the building is something that I'm still trying to uh, uh, understand. It's also my understanding, uh, according to some uh, whistleblower accounts, that that post was abandoned. What can you tell me about that? Why was it abandoned? So I saw that from uh, the Colonel's testimony, sir. And it's something that I've asked and our mission assurance is getting to the bottom of. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were two, two men counter sniper teams from the locals that were in that AGR building. And so at some point they just left? That I, I, I can't, I, I don't have an answer for you on that center, but it seems to me that if even one of them left, there should have been remaining some additional eyes left in that building. Yep. That seems like something that maybe should be one of the very first questions you address. I'm actually surprised that you don't know that already. And I, I, I'd, I'd ask that you submit to us in writing what you learn as soon as you learn it. Will you commit to that? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, by the way, I emailed um, Senator Lee's office and he said he has not received that answer in writing yet. Mm -hmm. um, does this surprise you that the answers are so slow to be trickling out? This seems like a pretty urgent issue to 
resolve. And certainly the, the senator should be able to get answers from the Secret Service. Yeah. Or, the lack of um, direct answers um, is ridiculous, right? The fact that Ron Rowe, who had spent, what, five years assigned to the presidential protective detail, as did I, he was the deputy director for a number of years. He's the current acting director. The fact that he can't answer that question, because that should have been the very first question that the senior leadership of the Secret Service should have asked, given this guy's breadth of experience and the positions that he has held, um, hey, how did the guy get up on the roof and who was supposed to be up on the roof? Yet he fails to provide any answer. Listen, he's not giving you an answer because he's buying himself time and buying the agency time to concoct some sort of answer that will deflect the heat from the Secret Service. The bottom line is there should have been a Secret Service agent on the roof of that building. I don't care how hot it is. I understand it's a Saturday morning. You can tell somebody, you know what, don't put a suit and tie on. You can dress down, you know, BDUs, jeans and a T-shirt. I don't care. But somebody from the Secret Service is going to be on that rooftop. That building is way too close for any Secret Service agent not to have considered that building in play. Not to mention the direct line of sight. And as I've said, given the fact that we're in Butler County, Pennsylvania, which is a big hunting state, to not realize that somebody or any number of people conceivably could show up at that event site with uh, AR-15s, hunting rifles, scope weapons, uh, you know, the most junior, most Secret Service agent would have realized that. And the fact that it wasn't done, that is just a cataclysmic failure on the part of the U.S. Secret Service. Ron Rowe is flat out lying when he says he never asked that question or he'll get back to us with the answer. No, no, no. We've been two and a half months into this. We've had a second assassination attempt um, and he still hasn't provided the answer. Um, the Secret Service is absolutely stonewalling in providing those answers and purposely giving us vague answers. And I would add to that, there is no way uh, a, a mid-level government employee, even though you have the fancy title director of the Secret Service, you still have a bunch of layers above you. There's no way he doesn't provide answers to congressmen and senators without high cover from the White House, his direct supervisor, Alejandro Mayorkas at the Department of Homeland Security, who no one has heard from about anything in, you know, in four years. Um, and I would also add in probably the attorney general who's given him some legal cover, right? The, the fact that we don't have answers to such a world-wide um, uh, event that was seen by millions of people on live, you know, 4D, um, for, you know, super um, uh, TV. Uh, this isn't some grainy eight millimeters of Pruda film from the from the 60s, right? Everyone saw what happened. And for this guy not to give answers, uh, that that is a conscious effort to deflect attention. You mentioned the role of the DHS, of the Department of Homeland Security mm -hmm. and Mayorkas uh, in you're you're saying that they are likely exerting pressure to or at least prov or providing some sort of cover to kind of hold back the information or trickle it out at a very slow pace. I know that you worked briefly within the Department Oop. of Homeland Security. Is there something um, from your experience there that you can use to speak to? Like, is there a cultural issue there that's that's causing the, this approach to play out? Yeah, I'll give you a, a personal example. So uh, obviously I was still with the Secret Service um, post September 11th when the Department of Homeland Security was first formed. I was actually in the New York field office uh, post 2003 until I, I retired from the Secret Service in 2010. Um, so I've had a lot of interaction with DHS. One of the positions I held while I was in the New York field office in my last couple of years, I was the DHS spokesperson in New York. So I can assure you from experience that Anything that went on uh, would be reported immediately back to Secret Service headquarters, who in turn would speak directly with the Secretary of Homeland Security, right? Because in the aftermath of September 11th, things would unfold in New York, where there were threats yeah. to the subway. Uh, we had some bomb threats, some potential terrorism incidents. Um, Homeland needed to know what was going on. So for, for anyone to think that information isn't being given back to Homeland Security before the acting director or the actual director prior to Ron Rowe taking over, just would go out and speak to Congress or speak to the public without speaking first with the Secretary of Homeland Security and the staff there, you're just wrong. I'll give you a great example. 
I had an incident that occurred. Uh, President Clinton maintains an office or maintained an office up in Harlem. Uh, one day, a staff member uh, received a package in the mail, opened up the package, and white powder fell out. Well, that caused an evacuation of an entire building at rush hour uh, in upper, you know, northern Manhattan, the Harlem area. Um, I responded to that incident. Uh, as did every other federal and local agency that you can imagine. Um, and within five minutes of getting there, the director of the Secret Service is on the phone speaking to me. He's on his other phone speaking to the director of Homeland Security. So I know firsthand that this is how this plays out. Yet we've heard nothing from Homeland specifically. Uh, mm -hmm. And anything we've heard from the Secret Service is so vague. And so, yeah, we're going to have to get back to you type of thing. Um, it's inconceivable that the director of the Secret Service just came up with those excuses on his own. He's doing that with under marching orders from Homeland Security. And, and I think well, one of the reasons they're doing that is intentionally yeah. to keep this out of the media um, at the direction of the White House, because we saw what happened in the in the aftermath of the first shooting and how much mm -hmm. of a bump President Trump took. Uh, and they're doing this as a, as a means once again to um, to to um, to mess with this election. And do whatever they can to uh, to keep Trump out of the media and be seen in any in good light. Because keep in mind, this is the same Secret Service and the same Secret Service leadership that in the past year has done things like um, send out emails to the field telling the guys that are working President Trump, we don't want you wearing red ties. It's seen as too partisan, right? This is the same Secret Service leadership that magically when cocaine is found in the White House, that just disappears without any real forensics or investigation being done. This is the same Secret Service that had two Secret Service agents um, uh, carjacked, right, um, while they were move, going to their vehicles on the streets of D.C. All of these things just speak to the, the mentality of where the Secret Service is and what's been going on, the decline of the Secret Service over the, the last couple of years and how politically um, um, motivated they are to go the other way and how pro-Biden they become. Well, the strength of the Secret Service always lied in the fact that they are bipartisan. We don't care who we're protecting. I've protected uh, Ahmadinejad from Iran. I've protected the president of China. Uh, we've protected a lot of people that, quite frankly, are anti-U.S., but that cannot interfere in the core mission of the U.S. Secret Service. But it has. And, and that's, that's the most basic problem at the Secret Service. So you uh, and I assume you are talking specifically about the leadership of the Secret Service. Um, I would assume that the actual agents have a variety of political beliefs and mm -hmm. allegiances. And I, I mean, I, I don't know how much I, I mean, you can speak to that better than I can. Is there a political dimension to how these organizations are structured? Because. This is the story that you hear from the Trump administration and yep. also from Ted Cruz, who we'll hear uh, oh. from in a, in a second, is that, you know, it's it's the deep state and the deep state is against Trump. Um, there's some level within there that is just overtly political. <laughs> you worked in the quote unquote deep state. Um, are they against right. Trump? Well, yeah, well, listen, it, 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 I hate to use the word deep state. I hate to use the word conspiracy because, you know, that brings a lot of things to mind. You know, this isn't a situation where somebody left a, uh, a lock opened or left the gate open or even left a ladder leaning against the side of a building to afford this guy crooks the opportunity to climb up on the roof. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying here is the political leanings of the leadership of the Secret Service and their quest for other positions down the line has certainly fed into, hey, we're going to give Trump the minimal level of protection we possibly can just to say that we're doing it. And this is what's happened. And I point out, look, the prior track record of the things the Secret Service leadership has done in the past year uh, to include, by his own admission, the acting director Rowe has said that event in Butler was the first time the Secret Service afforded President Trump the use of counter sniper assets in at least a year and a half. Well, you have counter sniper assets. You have President Biden, who really doesn't leave the White House. And when he does, where, where's he going? To Delaware to sit on the beach. You had Kamala Harris, who at that point in time was the sitting vice president. So her assets were fixed. She had a full blown vice presidential detail. Um, and you really didn't have anyone else other than President Trump. 
So my question to the Secret Service is, what were you doing with all these assets? What, these guys are just sitting around doing what? They were purposely held back from being afforded to travel with President Trump. And by doing so, you put President Trump in the in the proverbial crosshairs um, for something to happen. And this is what happened. You know, over the last two years, if not longer, the senior leaders of the U.S. government, to include the president of the United States, right, have likened Trump to the Antichrist, Hitler, the greatest existential threat to democracy, you know, anyone's ever seen. What did you think was going to happen as a result of these statements? They've just incited every fringe lunatic and nut job in the world to go out and say, you know what? I've got to save democracy. I've got to save, you know, the world from the Antichrist. I'm going to go out and take a shot at this guy, let alone, you know, who knows what's going on behind the scenes with with some real professional people um, that may be spurred into action because of just the stance that President Trump has taken on any number of things uh, as he's out and about during his campaigning. Yeah, I mean, I've got to assume, and correct me if I'm wrong here as someone with experience in Secret Service, that there's constantly threats around any figure of this at at this level from either political party. There's always lunatics out there that want to kill them. This is uh, the qu- the central question here. Really, is why is why is it happening right now? Why did we get two sh- two cl- disturbingly close calls within the space of a couple months during a campaign? That, like we've never seen this um, in our lifetimes. Uh, I, I, as I mentioned in the intro, you know, someone took a shot at Teddy Roosevelt. Even yep. then, it was you know one shot. Um, so th- there's clearly something going wrong here. And what I'm hoping to get to in this conversation is like, is it is it just incompetence and negligence or is there something more sinister going on here? Um, you know, Ted Cruz uh, is sort of making the point that you raised earlier in this yep. clip we're about to roll. He believes that there is uh, there are overtly political decisions that have led to under coverage of Trump. Um, let's roll yeah. Ted Cruz's clip, and I'd like to get your thoughts on the argument okay. that he's laying out here. I believe that the Secret Service leadership made a political decision to deny these requests. And I think the Biden administration has been suffused with partisan politics. Did the same person who denied the request for additional security to President Trump also repeatedly deny the request for security to Robert F. Kennedy Jr., whose father was murdered by an assassin and whose uncle was murdered by an assassin. Did the same person make that decision? Senator, what I will tell you is that Secret Service agents are not political. Okay, you're not answering my question. But but you know what? Leadership appointed by the president, leadership appointed by the president is political. I have a simple question, yes or no. Did the same person deny the Trump request that also denied the RFK request? That's a yes or no question. Uh, Senator, that is not a yes or no question. One, there is a process for a candidate nominee to receive protection. Is there, does the buck stop anywhere? Does the buck stop anywhere? That is a bicameral, bipartisan process that the Hill participates. It's a bicameral, bipartisan process. What camera? For a candidate, for a candidate You are not a Congress, you don't have a camera. Mr. Kennedy submitted a request that was referred over to the CPAC. Okay, you're refusing to answer the question. Let me ask, because the failures on that day were catastrophic. By the way, is it true that on the day of the, of the Butler event that Secret Service transferred agent from President Trump to the First Lady? Uh, no, sir, that's not true. That's been widely reported. Uh, it's not true. There was one airport agent that actually went on the manpower request for the Trump detail. They handled the arrival at the airport what for is the First the rel- Lady. What was the relative the size of the Trump detail compared to the detail that is assigned to the President of the First Lady? Uh, Senator, the former president travels with a full shift, just like the president. What's the so the exact same size? Is that your testimony that that President Trump had the same size detail that President Biden has? On the day of in Butler, the agents surrounding him, it is the same number of agents surrounding the president today. There is a difference between a sitting president who also not only Hold hold on, you're using president in a way that is not clear. Is it your testimony that in Butler, Pennsylvania, Donald Trump had the same number of agents protecting him that Joe Biden has at a comparable event. I'm telling you the shift, the close protection shift surrounding. That's, that's yes what you no. asked me, Senator, and I'm trying to answer it. 
You are not answering it. Is it the same number of agents or not? Senator, there is a difference between the sitting president of the United States. Then what's the difference? The difference? 2X, 3X, 5X, National 10X. Command Authority to launch a nuclear strike, I, sir. I'm, there I'm are not other assets how many that more travel agents? with the president that sir, the former president sir, will you are not get. To but the number straight. of Secret Service sir, agents stop protecting him. Stop, stop interrupting me. Go ahead, you Senator. You are refusing to answer clear and direct questions. I am asking the relative difference in the number of agents between those assigned to Donald Trump and those assigned to Joe Biden. I'm not asking why you assign more to Joe Biden. I'm asking, is the difference, is it 2X? Is it 3X? Is it 5X? Is it 10X? Senator, I will get you that number so you can see it with your own eyes. Okay. Um, you, so uh, again, it's a little bit astounding that he can't ballpark what the difference is and just answer Cruz's question. Um, but what what do you make of his response? You know, he is answering there that there's a difference between a sitting president and a former president who's running the right. president, which, again, is an unusual situation. It's not something we've seen in our lifetime where you've got a one term president who then, you know, loses and then is running again. So it is a unique situation. But what is there legitimacy to that idea that Actually, yeah, there should be different coverage for Biden versus Trump. Well, Zach, I think you hit it right on the head, right? This is a unique and an unusual situation, right? Mm. Prior to Trump, when you talked about a former president, the level of protection and the level of manpower and assets afforded to the sitting president of the United States and the former president uh, really was like night and day, right? Um, when... when um, Ted Cruz is asking about multiples in terms of manpower. There isn't even a comparison. It, it really is. It goes from hundreds of people for the sitting president of the United States and, and you, you know, multiple aircraft and helicopters and 50, 60 car motorcades to, you know, five guys in a, uh, in a rented suburban. Right. And when you talk about a former president, what comes to mind is, you know, 99 year old Jimmy Carter who shows up, you know, maybe on Christmas and he's going to uh, go, uh, you know, do something at a Habitat for Humanity event or, yeah. you know, former President Bush, you know, maybe we see him once a year. He shows up on TV and he wishes people, you know, Merry Christmas, that type of thing. Uh, President Trump, if anything, I, and I don't think this is a, a reach when I say this, this guy's um, profile and his world standing has done nothing but exponentially increase since he's left office, right? This guy's traveling all over the world. He travels in a big aircraft that says Trump on the side. You know, for the Secret Service to have treated him simply as a former president, huge mistake there. The Secret Service loves to hide behind this phrase, there's no adverse actionable intelligence. And they use that, the the threat level, the amount of, of intelligence that they're gathering, um, to figure out what kind of manpower and assets they'll afford a protectee of the service. Normally that would work, but to sit there and think, and you tell me if I'm wrong as a non-Secret Service you know, person, to sit there and think that some group, organized group, is going to telegraph their intentions to shoot President Trump or cause the Trump family some harm to interfere or impact the potential outcome of this election, you're just totally wrong. Right. So to act on, well, since we didn't, we don't know about anything, no one's nothing's come to light. That's going to allow us to dictate the manpower and assets we give to Trump. I don't know what you're thinking. You are not a trained Secret Service agent if you're taking that approach and keep something else in mind. Ted Cruz mentioned RFK. And again, the Secret Service acting director says, well, we didn't give him protection because he didn't meet certain requirements and there was no adverse actionable intelligence. Hey, the guy's last name is Kennedy. Is there sure. anyone in the world who would be surprised if the Secret Service declined to provide protection to this guy, particularly as he declares himself a presidential candidate? You know, I have to ask, what are you thinking by not providing a guy named Kennedy? In this guy case, his father was killed um, and his uncle, right, which has led to conspiracy theories that will be spoken about till the end of time. Seventy years later, we're still debating, you know, what went on there. Um, yet the yeah. Secret Service doesn't provide protection to him. I think that just gives insight into into the the thinking process or lack of thinking process of the Secret Service leadership. Total nonsense. Not to mention, look at this guy, Roe. 
Do you, does he appear to have the composure that's necessary to deal not just with Congress, to answer the most basic questions? The guy's argumentative and combative. He represents 7,000 employees at the Secret Service, yet you're arguing with the guys who ultimately will approve your budget. And if you're right. asking for more money, that is a terrible stance to take with these folks, uh, certainly when you're on TV, getting into an argument with, the, with these guys, considering you're going to be asking for more money and more assets. Um, how much, this guy should how, not be the acting director. How much autonomy does the Secret Service have in deciding where to allocate assets? Is that pretty much made by someone like Cheadle or Roe, or are they in consultation with other uh, other agencies, with the White House? Like, how does how does that all work? Um, now, the, 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 it, historically, the Secret Service has full autonomy in deploying their assets, you know, manpower and resources, right? So the way it works is if I'm a site agent in the field, I go out and do my site, my site survey, I put my diagram together and I, I start with, okay, where's the arrival point? Um, and then I take it from there. He's going to walk from the arrival point. He's going to walk to the podium. You know, how do I need to post this thing? What kind of perimeter do I need to set up? How many Secret Service agents do I need? I take that number. I kick it back to the uh, the field office supervisor. They go to headquarters and, and they say, hey, Rich Starpole, he's the site agent here in Butler. He needs 75 guys. Okay, fine. Secret Service comes up with 75 Secret Service agents. Now, what can happen is during campaign years, as things get really, really busy and it gets logistically more difficult to move Secret Service agents quickly enough to go from site to site, the Secret Service will rely on other agencies to provide you know, manpower. When the Secret Service was under Treasury, the Secret Service would go to other Treasury agencies, IRS, uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms. Um, in some cases, maybe we'd have to go to the U.S. Marshals, which is under DOJ. But one of the things about going to DHS was that would afford the Secret Service manpower pool that could come from 23 other agents, 22 other agencies under DHS, and open up a manpower pool of 500,000 employees. The problem is what kind of manpower um, asset are you going to get? Because one of the requirements that the Secret Service has imposed from these other DHS um, agencies is that the manpower that they provide to the Secret Service, those people have to be available to go out and work nonstop for three weeks, for 21 days. So who's going to volunteer for that? You either get new and inexperienced people who think, hey, why not? I'm the new guy. I'd love to go out with the Secret Service and do this and jump from city to city to city for 21 days. Or you're going to get guys that are ready for retirement, that are taking advantage of an opportunity, one of the very few opportunities in the federal government to uh, to pad their retirement, to, to collect as much overtime as they can. And now you're going to get somebody that yeah. really doesn't want to be there. He's doing it for, and he certainly doesn't want to be out there on a hot Saturday morning in July, standing in a field in Butler, PA. So in a sense, yeah, I can tick the box and get you the manpower, but it's not the right manpower. The, these these right. people are up to getting the job done, and therein lies one of the problems. Yeah, so that's that raises the next issue I wanted to get to, which is staffing, because yep. that's partly what we've heard from the Secret Service is that they're just stretched too thin. There was an interesting moment in this hearing that we're playing clips from, which, by the way, is from July 30th, so a couple weeks it? after the Butler shooting, um, where Dick Durbin is pressing Roe about the budget because he's saying, look, we've doubled the budget over 10 years yeah. and it's like, why are you struggling right now? Let's roll that clip and I'd like you to talk a little bit about your perspective on the staffing sure. of the Secret Service. Congress has nearly dub doubled the budget for the Secret Service over the last 10 years, from $1.8 billion in fiscal year 2014 to $3 billion in fiscal year 2024. Despite this large increase in funding, the number of agents in protect protective operations has fallen from 4,027 to 3,671 during that same time period, an approximate 9% reduction. Acting Director Rowe, what accounts for protective operations losing 356 agents over the past 10 years? So, Senator, uh, 
with respect to where we are today on staffing, and then I'll address the the ten year uh, where we were. And this year alone, we are going to end the year uh, on the positive of 200 plus agents. That's the first time in a number of years that we've been able to do that. Part of that was gaining some efficiencies uh, in our hiring process. Director I think there was a variety of factors. Some of it was the pandemic. Some of it was um, you know, the economy or other opportunities. We have people that are very skilled in cyber that often leave the job. Some of the protective skills that they acquire are also in demand in the private sector. But some of the mechanisms that we've put in place just in the last year is also retaining our workforce. And that's what we are focused on right now. Did you feel like the Secret Service was underfunded during your time there? Does the story that Roe is laying out there about the pandemic uh, add up with what you've seen? No, as a matter of fact, I think it's just the opposite, right? The pandemic and the poor economics uh, that the U.S. is going through would only increase the number of applicants, right? The Secret Service sure. has never had an applicant problem. It's never had a uh, a recruitment problem, right? It The problem now is you've got a, a former director who, by her own admission, said she's on a quest, a DEI quest, to, uh, to get as many women and minorities uh, hired as quickly as possible, uh, which led to uh, poor recruiting practices and the washing out of people who were perfectly qualified applicants but as she's pursuing, you know, we're not going to hire these people because we're specifically targeting women. Um, that's a problem, right? Um, not to mention, look, Ron Rowe and the senior leadership of the Secret Service, some of whom were seated behind them at that congressional uh, testimony, they've been in position for four years, right, since, since Biden became president. Yet it never occurred to you folks that through attrition, the Secret Service is losing more and more guys. Um, that 200 number he speaks about being up 200, he doesn't mean 200 overall. He's talking yeah. about just in that last fiscal year, they've hired 200 people. The problem is they are so below where they should to be, should be, that that should have been addressed years ago, right? This is not the New York City Police Department where when they hire a police class, you're getting 3,000 people at a time. When the Secret Service hires a class, they hire 24 people at a time. So if you can get 20 people through the class, you know, people drop out due to maybe they get injured or they they can't shoot, they can't qualify, that type of thing. So on average, you're losing two or four people. So we'll call it 20 people at, at a time. Well, it takes a year for the investigative process to get done to the point where they can hire someone. And then another six months as they go through the various, you know, training courses before they get assigned to a field office. Um, yet apparently this has never been addressed by any of the leadership at the Secret Service. The budget question comes up all the time. The budget right now sits about three and a half billion dollars. Listen, there are plenty of companies in the United States, if not the world, that would be incredibly successful if I gave them a three and a half billion dollar budget. The problem is, is in how the money is allocated um, and frankly spent. The Secret Service has a tendency to continue to um, um, promote people from within the ranks. And ultimately what happens is, and you see this when you look at the business side of the House of the Secret Service, the chief operating officer has no real business acumen, no financial world experience. It's an agent that got promoted and now holds the title of chief operating officer. The same thing with chief executive officer, head of communications, CFO, so on and so forth. These people uh -huh. are nowhere near qualified to manage a budget of three and a half billion dollars. That is a huge number. And keep in mind, the people managing that Budget, these are government employees who are making $180,000 a year. What appreciation do they have and knowledge that they bring to the table that of, would afford them the opportunity to manage that kind of budget? There's no company in the world that would allow somebody in that position to manage that kind of budget. So again, it's a poor promotion practice that led to that money just being thrown away. And I, I mentioned earlier about the overtime. There are very few federal agencies that afford, um, at least from a law enforcement perspective, agents the opportunity to make overtime. Even with the fact the Secret Service can pay overtime in certain situations, like protective situations, there's a salary cap. So I would yeah. argue that if anybody knew what they were doing from a CFO perspective, you know what the, what the worst case scenario is in terms of having to pay people. Yet you don't yeah. project out for that and budget for that. That's a problem in itself. And I'll, I'll leave you with, with some of these numbers. When I was in the New York field office, they had 227 agents. As of about a month ago, they were down to 81. That is a huge problem. That is the largest, that is known as the flagship office in the Secret Service. 
how did no one address this over the mm. course of the last, you know, at least four years? What are these guys doing? This is why I say the Secret Service is broken in many respects. So this sounds like in some ways sort of the classic story of a government agency that just becomes bloated and perpetuates yep. its own administrative class at the expense of pursuing its mission to the greatest and most excellent degree possible. Um, and yep. it kind of, you know, mission drift is another thing that happens to government agencies a lot where we're fulfilling some other priority instead of our main purpose, which is to protect these high high value political actors. Um, and I wonder if that explain can partially explain this the idea that it was too hot to get up on the roof because is it like this is their way of retaining a uh, workforce is we're going to accommodate your discomfort uh, and you know not make you get up on a hot roof and that was why that sort of bureaucratic kind of nonsensical management decision is that one possible explanation as to why no one was up there yeah, as simple as that sounds, I've been asked that question many times. And my answer is, yeah. If you don't think okay. that fact that it was a hot Saturday afternoon and you had to put someone on a metal roof um, affected the decision to actually tell a fellow agent, hey, that's your post on that roof, or even led to a guy being posted or a woman being posted on that roof and they just simply said, I'm not staying up here. It's too hot. Um, yeah, mm. I've Bet you if we did a little more digging, that's exactly how this played out. Now, I've done some pretty big sites in some crazy adverse conditions. Uh, during the Republican National Convention, I was a site agent in Penn Station, which was open to the 300,000 commuters and the five rail lines throughout the entire duration of that week of the convention. Listen, there's some pretty hot spots down in some of those tunnels. Guys, they don't want to be down there, but you got to figure out how to make this work. And if that yeah. means... Instead of using one guy to hold the post, I use two, and they push each other off every half hour so a guy can go sit in the air conditioning. You make the accommodation. So even if we would have needed to put two people on that roof, give a guy a an umbrella, a cooler with water, whatever, the, the weather cannot be a factor in 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 your um, explanation for not putting a guy on that roof. You know, we, this isn't the Teamsters Union, right? Whereas you're a Secret Service agent. We've got people, and, and this isn't just for the protection of President Trump, whether you like Trump or not, you had 15 or 20,000 American citizens at that event with their families trying to see something that they may never get to see again. And you don't have the, the foresight to say, hey, we need to post somebody up there because if somebody gets up there and opens fire, he may not hit Trump, but he's going to hit people up. And that's exactly what happened. Right. A guy was killed. That firefighter, Corey Comparatore, was killed in front of his family. You had two other people shot. Right. People are traumatized for the rest of their life. Some people may never leave their houses. And they go to another outdoor event again. Right. Hmm. And that's how you've got. That's the mindset and the approach that I always took to any site that I ever did. I'm not just here for the, the protectee, regardless of what my political leanings were. I'm here to protect the citizenry and the people that are showing up for that event. So that's a long-winded way of saying, yeah, you're right. The weather certainly did play a factor in that decision of, of putting a guy up on that roof. And I bet you, you may find out they put a Secret Service agent on that roof and he simply walked away. Because what we're left with now at the Secret Service due to the attrition are either people that are brand new with no experience that just take a, a much different attitude than somebody with 10 or 11 years on the job would do, or people that are incompetent to begin with somehow yeah. got the job at the Secret Service due to any number of initiatives or who they knew, that type of thing. And they don't have the 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 wherewithal to even fill out an application to go somewhere else. So yeah. the few people that are left at the Secret Service, the level of incompetency and complacency has permeated into the ranks. And, you know, unlike Amazon, where you've got 100,000 employees in one warehouse, you know, off Route 80 in New Jersey, Secret Service can't afford to have this many people that are just incompetent and aren't going to do the job. And this is what you're left with. Yeah, this is all, this entire explanation is certainly pushing me towards the incompetence and bureaucratic yeah. bloat explanation for how these events unfolded, which honestly, that's that's usually where my mind goes when I'm 
thinking about the federal government as opposed to something more coordinated or malicious. But one alternative uh, explanation that I've heard people float out there is that, yes, there's incompetence, but it was a sort of weaponized incompetence or intentional negligence. Like it was like, we know there's these threats floating out there, right? There's constantly people that want to kill presidents or presidential candidates always. And you kind of just know that if you pull back the resources or withhold the resources, that you're increasing the odds of something like this happening, especially in a heightened rhetorical environment like this. Um, And so therefore, you know, something like weaponized negligence is what we is how we should look at that. How do you view that explanation? Well, I I like that phrase, weaponized negligence. Yes, and I'd agree with that. At the senior levels where the key decisions are made to allocate manpower and resources, absolutely was was politically motivated and and weaponized, right? Because as I've said, the leadership, specifically the director and the deputy director, are not acting in a bubble, right? They're not declining manpower and resources um, on their own, knowing what potentially could happen here. If anything, on the direction so you're talking the about tech- Kimberly Cheadle specifically. Um, you believe that she's she was motivated uh, more so by politics than by yep. uh, leading the most effective Secret Service organization. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I'll stand behind that. I mean, look at how she got the job, right? Um, and look at her performance, right? Her, her level of incompetence. How did was she only, get the um, job? Could you? Uh, well, yeah, sure. So, so Kim yeah. Cheadle, the, her, her only um, claim to fame at the Secret Service was she was assigned to the vice presidential detail when she, it came time to do her protection. And she happened to be assigned to the Jill Biden detail. So basically, she was an armed you know, coffee go getter for the second lady of, of the United States. Yet, yeah. how does somebody with such a, a benign career track become the director of the Secret Service? She was appointed by, you know, Dr. Jill Biden, and she became the director of the Secret Service. And by her own admissions, right, and look at the travel logs, this lady spent the last four years until the time she was forced to resign traveling the world at taxpayer expense, attending all these DEI conferences and and pushing all this this agenda of we've got to get more females at the Secret Service. Look at the, the, the decision that was made with the Trump detail, right? After those shots were fired, the the six agents assigned to the Trump detail, we commonly refer to as, as the body guys, right? The media refers to them as the body guys. They all show up on stage, and instead of just piling on Trump and rushing him off the stage, you know, they sit there for a little over two minutes, which is a whole other story. You know, why that was done is, is beyond any reasonable Secret Service agent. But once they leave the stage, look at the shift deployment around the the motorcade, right? Six Mm -hmm. Secret Service agents assigned to the Trump detail, three of whom turn out to be women, right? That is not done coincidentally. If you took all the names of the Secret Service agents in the Secret Service and put them in a hat, I would bet that you would go 100, 200 names deep before you could pull out a female's name. Yet you're Mm. telling me it's just coincidence that half the detail happened to be women? That decision was made from a pure optics standpoint by former director Cheadle, right? Hey. And by the way, former director Cheadle didn't resign under pressure, right? Because we know no one in this administration gets fired. No one takes accountability for anything. I mean, you know, Britt Hume described the cabinet right now as the weakest cabinet he's ever seen that takes no responsibility for anything that they do. I have to agree with that. Kim Cheadle left the Secret Service because her personal attorneys told her, you are better protected if you resign because now you're just a civilian and you're, you now have all sorts of rights uh, and privileges that any citizen would have. You stay in the position of director and refuse to resign. You are now a government employee that holds a top secret SCI clearance, which I do as well, um, still as a civilian. Um, you can be um, um, forced into providing additional testimony and doing things that a normal citizen couldn't do. So that's Mm -hmm. why she left the Secret Service. It had nothing to do with her being forced to resign. She'd still be sitting there, right? The 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 other issue is what's left on the ground, right? The people on the in the field now, what's left there, um, the level of complacency and incompetence uh, has no place to hide. And over the last four years, not only has the the incompetency uh, have to be dealt with, but now these people have been promoted. 
and they're ascending the ranks where they can make key decisions. And they shouldn't be making those decisions as a field agent, let alone as a supervisor. So it's a cascading effect that's coming at the Secret Service from the leadership as well as from the supervisors in the field. Uh, and the Secret Service just is not equipped to handle that. Yeah. So, I mean, that all seems to me like it falls under the umbrella of what we were talking about of either bureaucratic bloat or concern yeah. with the optics or quotas or what have you. But I'm wondering about the more, I don't know, sinister explanation that mm -hmm. someone in the government wanted this to happen or kind of set things in motion so that this was more likely to happen um, and, and and not really caring. Um, like, do you think someone in the government, whether it's Secret Service, DHS, someone in the, the decision making level at some level wanted this to happen? I don't know if we'd say wanted it to happen, but certainly should have seen it coming. Right now, I don't know if a discussion ever took place amongst the direct the leadership of the Secret Service, the leadership of DHS unnamed sources, you know, people at the White House and the attorney general's office that they said, hey, you know, um, let, let's see what we can do to put this guy in a position where something can happen. But I do think and, and I, I think if I you gave me some time, I bet you I could probably give more credence to this. There had to be conversations that that occurred um, within the Secret Service leadership, right? They've got 10 assistant directors that run various positions. You've got another 10 deputy assistant directors. This is the senior leadership of the Secret Service, the deputy director and the director. I know they have meetings every Monday, full staff meetings. You're telling me none of these leaders ever raised his hand and said, you know, if we keep cutting back all these assets and continue to treat Trump as just another former president or as a simple candidate, we're inviting something to happen. You're telling me no one said that? I I'm not buying sure. that at all. I think what happened there is you've got a deputy director and you've seen this act, Ron Rowe. The guy's combative. He cuts a big path. He's loud. I think he just said, you know what? We're going to do this my way. And he took his marching orders from the Secretary of Homeland Security and from the White House. And they said, cut back all the assets you possibly can. And they knew, although it was probably never discussed, you're opening the door to something happen. Right now, the Secret Service has 30, at least 30 other protective details uh, that are being covered within the Biden administration. That includes people like the White House press spokesman, the deputy press spokesperson, the national security advisor, their deputies. Most of these people would walk out of the back door of the White House. Nobody would know who these people are. Yet President Biden, by executive order, authorized the Secret Service to provide details to these people. Why? They put them in a car, right? There's plenty of government cars with drivers that are at the White House. Drive them to where they got to go, and that's the end of it. Get them a, an armed Capitol police officer or a D.C. Metro. Why are you using Secret Service resources for these people? And that includes Hunter Biden, right? So Hunter Biden, the guy who's 60 years old, hasn't paid taxes in five years, made, what, $35 million through Burisma, is afforded Secret Service protection at taxpayer expense? Hey, these people can afford their own protection. Why, if, if you're so um, short of resources, for the guy who may become the next president of the United States, and if he gets killed, this is going to have worldwide implications for the entire United States. You're so short of resources. Why are we protecting all these other people? The same thing with, and you claim you're short of resources. Hey, walk down to the United Nations in New York City this week and look at all those details that are out there. Where the Secret Service get all those people and resources from? So to tell me you don't have the manpower and resources, I'm not buying that at all. And, and you mentioned a few minutes ago about the government bloat. Look at yeah. the last press conference that Ron Rowe was forced to do. And what does he say? We need more money and we're going to stand up. He mentioned at least three other um, divisions that the Secret Service is going to stand up to ensure that this never happens again. Not nah, all nonsense. There is no need for any of that. Get back to the basics. Do what you do best. And you've been doing for 150 years. And these problems go away. They're not yeah. being addressed. That's the issue. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, we're going to need to see the internal communications to be able to determine that question of, you know, yep. whether someone was raising these risks and whether that was ignored, you know, after what was revealed in the wake of uh, COVID about some of the conversations yep. going on between Fauci and his inner circle, yep. I would not be surprised to see some 
uh, pretty bad decisions come to light. Hopefully, you know, through FOIA requests and this testimony, it will come out sooner rather than later, although it seems to be coming out at a trickle. Um, I want to move to the second attempt uh, for mm -hmm. the end of this conversation, which um, and, and to get there, I want to talk about another explanation that has been floated out there as to why this has happened twice now to Donald Trump. And that is that he has made it exceptionally difficult for the Secret Service to provide protection by uh, holding these open these big open air rallies or in the case of his outings. Um, this is a Washington Post uh, headline. Trump's golf outings have long concerned Secret Service. Uh, and they write that authorities tried to warn Trump okay. about the risks posed okay. by golfing at his own courses okay. because of their proximity to public roads. They reasoned that if photographers <laughs> with long range lenses could get the president in their sights while he golfed, so too could potential gunmen. But okay. Trump insisted that his clubs were safe. So is there a sense in which, you know, Trump by golfing at these unsecured locations sort of on a whim without enough time for Secret Service to fully scope out the site has made himself more of a target? No, again, this is just a poor excuse for the Secret Service to, to try and, and get away with the fact that they didn't provide the appropriate manpower to this golf course. Listen, there have always been um, sites that sitting presidents um, have attended. They may not go there every day, but they visit them with enough regularity that the Secret Service historically, when I say historically, I mean, let's call it free Kim Cheadle, Ron Road days, right? Mm -hmm. um, historically, the Secret Service would assign a site agent to these particular venues. You know, the, the Waco Ranch that Bush owns in Waco, Texas was one of them. So the Secret Service had a guy who basically lived at that ranch. So in the event that President Bush would show up there, he knew how to pre-post this and what assets and manpower required, where all the blind spots were and the potential hot spots, right? There was the same thing for the, the Clinton office in Harlem. There was an agent assigned there. The Obama residence, uh, Kenneth Bunkport with, with former president of uh, mm -hmm. 41, right? The fact that it wasn't done here, uh, it, there's no reason for that. There's, I have no sound logical explanation for you other than the oh, Secret yeah. Service leadership said, we're just not going to do this, right? And what are those facilities? You've had the Trump golf course in Bedminster, where he's here all the time. You've got mm -hmm. this golf course in Florida. You've got Mar-a-Lago. How does the Secret Service not simply say to him, hey, Mr. President, we're going to Florida. Are you going to play golf uh, this weekend? And his answer would have been, yeah, I'm having breakfast with Hannity and Steve Whitcoff uh, Sunday morning. Then we're going to hit the links. No problem. Pick up the phone. You call that site agent. And he pre-posts everything and gets canine and the air assets and, and everything out there. And there's no issue. This goes away. Yeah. You know, we did this, and I personally did this with President Clinton when he was campaigning, right? We went from the, the Reagan-Bush years where these guys really never left the, uh, the White House uh, and if they did, it was very well coordinated and scheduled to President Clinton, who was like traveling with Elvis. He would do yeah. all this impromptu last minute stuff. But there were plenty of times where I, as a site agent assigned to the president, would say to my supervisor, hey, we can't get this thing locked down. And he'd go right to the chief of staff. And there's never an issue. This nonsense that well, Trump is unapproachable, you can't do this. No, absolutely no answer to that. That's nonsense. The guy yeah. is a businessman. And anyone that's worked in the business environment knows, and I'm sure in your field as well, people are busy. He doesn't have 15 to 20 minutes for idle conversation. Tell him what you need, get an answer, and then move on. He's not unapproachable in that respect. Now, am I going to sit on the plane with him and shoot the breeze for 20 minutes talking about the weather? Probably not. But there's no reason I couldn't say to him, hey, you're going to play golf tomorrow. So that that excuse goes out the window. Yeah. That golf well, course, a known entity, the guy owns it. He's played that course how many times in the last 20 years? Whether he was planning on getting there at 9 a.m. or 2 in the afternoon, irrelevant. That course should have been posted. There were no. Well, let's look at. Good. Yeah, I just, I just want to remind the viewers here uh, what, hap what exactly happened here. Yep. I've uh, pulled this. Aerial shot from this is from the uh, arrest record of um, of yep. the shooter uh, Richard R or uh, Ruth and um, he what you can see here the arrow there is pointing to Trump was somewhere around that area uh, golfing on the fifth hole 
and he was hiding out uh, behind these bushes near the sixth hole, and a an agent saw a, a rifle barrel mm-hmm. poking out of the hole there. So, um, and then he fled, and they they caught him in a car. So, obviously, much better job done here than in Pennsylvania. Still, uh, much too close for comfort. But what I was struck by was actually the press conference that was given the day this happened some comments made by the Palm Beach Sheriff that I want to play and get your reaction to, because again, it speaks to the sort of staffing and allocation of assets issue. John, could you roll that clip? So, how was this able to happen? And for future reference, is there any of security in the golf course? Well, you got to understand the golf course is surrounded by shrubbery. So, so when somebody gets into the shrubbery, they're pretty much out of sight. All right. And at this level that he is at right now, he's not the sitting president. If he was, we would have had this higher golf course around it. But because he's not, the security is limited to the areas that the Secret Service deems possible. So I would imagine that the next time he comes at a golf course, there'll probably be a little bit more people around the perimeter. But the Secret Service did exactly what they should have done. They provided exactly what the protection should have been. And their agent did a fantastic job. If this had been, um, you know, President Biden golfing, they would have had agents stationed along the perimeter. And in the future, they will learn from their mistakes and put uh, agents along the perimeter. What's your what did, did you see that statement? What is your reaction to what the sheriff is saying there? I did see the statement. Listen, I thought that sheriff did a terrific job, right? He did exactly what you should be doing, particularly following a, you know, an assassination attempt or an incident like this. The guy's before the cameras. He's answering things as well as he can. And, he, and he's providing you know reasonable, logical answers, given the point in time that he's, that he's speaking, right? Um, but here again, this is another um, opportunity for the Secret Service to push this off on local law enforcement. This is not local law enforcement's um, wheelhouse. Why did the Secret Service not say to local law enforcement or to the state police again, because this is their their thing, hey, get a couple of cars, and as the president's moving on the golf course, just as the agents on the course are moving one or two holes ahead, we like you guys, and you can do this in your car, just move ahead on the roadway, which is adjacent to the golf course, and just kind of stay one or two holes ahead of where just to make sure no one parks, gets out of their car, and walks up to the fence line with the homemade law rocket and shoots this guy's golf cart and blows it to smithereens. But this isn't done. That would have been taken care of if you would have had that that site that site agent, as I spoke about, you know, already pre-posted. You know, the, the other issue with this thing and, and the, the issue I have with that picture is it says subject hiding in the bushes. Guy wasn't hiding in the bushes. The guy parked his car uh, on the side of the road, got out, took a bunch of camping equipment, walked into the bushes and was just sitting there, right? Okay. Hiding implies to me that this guy was, you know, had a ghillie suit on. He's, you know, he's covered with dirt. He's dug in. That's not what happened here. This guy had a camping stool with him and was sitting there with a the rifle. Yet nobody sees this guy. Where's the canine? Where's the EOD teams? Why didn't the Secret Service just instruct the local cop? Hey, can you walk the fence line on the other side of the fence to make sure nobody's in there? Because we know in the past photographers have been there. And the way I handle the photographers, listen, if a guy's there taking pictures and a cop walks up to him and I say, who is that guy? He goes, he's a photographer. He may or may not have a press credential, but he's taking pictures. Fine. Let him take his pictures and get out of there. No, because you're wasting time, right? That's a a hell of a lot different story than, yeah, I'm walking the fence line. There's a guy sitting here with a rifle. That's got to be addressed. And it simply wasn't. Again, another failure on the part of the service. One more clip I want to play is of Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, who is opening his own state level investigation sure. into this incident. They're charging the shooter with attempted murder. What? And uh, his explanation as to why they're doing that and the value of uh, doing a state level as opposed to just the federal investigation yeah. was pretty interesting to me. I think what will, um, well, what will reveal, I think, is the important thing. What the state does is going to be made public. I mean, if you guys know who are from Florida, you can FOIA a lot of, of, of the stuff that's done in these investigations under Florida Sunshine Laws, and then they have a charge 
to be very frank and exercise candor with the public. Uh, I want the information to get out. I do not want any of the information uh, kept under wraps. We, we're not a party to anything that happened in terms of the state, state of Florida government. I mean, we have been asked to help in the past on security, and we're always willing to do that. But that wasn't our primary. We were not uh, responsible for it that day. Um, we've not been responsible for any of the prosecutions that have been brought against the former president. So we're in a great, great situation to be able to look at this with clear eyes, uh, get answers, and then deliver those answers to the public. Um, I don't think anyone can honestly claim that the federal government has been forthright and transparent about its past investigations. That's just the reality. That's just how these guys operate. Apart from any type of political bias, that's how it's been uh, really for many, many years. That's not how it's going to be here. Uh, and so we'll, we'll cooperate with, with all agency or all levels of government because I think that some of those gun charges may be appropriate to bring, but not to the exclusion of bringing a charge for something like attempted murder. Uh, I, and I will just, uh, from a journalistic perspective, back up a little bit what DeSantis yes. is saying there, which is Florida does have very good transparency laws. We've got the Sunshine Law, yep. and that explains why you often hear these crazy Florida man stories is because right. it's very easy to get information from law enforcement and publish these wild stories. But in this case, do, how do you feel about the state getting involved, the state of Florida getting involved in this investigation, and do you buy what DeSantis is saying that perhaps this will shed light uh, uh, on an issue that otherwise would be sort of shrouded in the normal secrecy that these agencies operate under? Yeah, it's sure. I, I first of all, I, I agree with what the governor is looking to do here. His ultimate objective to get this information out there, right? Otherwise, this will be talked about for 70 years, and it already has. The damage is done already, right? right. Um, so maybe this is one conduit where we can at least put a small piece of this to rest by taking it through the state courts from the perspective of we want to get this information out there. Um, you know, this is not, and I've, I've described this before, this is not an FBI organized crime investigation that's ongoing where we've got uh, people that have infiltrated the Gambino crime family or a DEA investigation that they're working in conjunction with the CIA where, you know, we've got aircraft and airborne assets. Mm -hmm. Given the, the magnitude and the gravity of what happened here and the, the effects this has on the world as, as well as the U.S., this cannot be looked at as another Warren Commission investigation where everything is shrouded in this veil of secrecy. Once this happened, that's gone. And that includes the identities and the names of the Secret Service agents involved here. That includes all the, I want to see photographs of all the assets at Butler and in Florida. Who was where? What were they told? What were they supposed to do? Right? Because we don't want to be talking about this. This all speaks to the the public's confidence, which has now been greatly undermined in the ability of the Secret Service to do the job, right? And yeah. we'll, that's going to be a problem for generations. I don't know how you fix that problem, right? Because if the Secret Service has successes, how do you claim credit for success, right? Because you, you don't know what you thwarted, right? The problem is by not speaking out about these things and giving us all this, this bureaucratic bloat and all this other nonsense, you're just feeding into this. So the governor's approach here is absolutely right. We've got to get this information out there. Yeah, the the tr waning trust in institutions has been well, going on for over a decade now, yeah. and um, it's certainly hitting all the uh, security and law enforcement agencies, yeah. especially the FBI, which is heading yeah. up the federal investigation. This strange character of Ryan Ruth, who was the sh the second shooter, yep. raises a lot of red flags for people because there's just strange circumstances around him. Yeah. First of all, this is his rap sheet. He, yep. you know, goes back for many years. This is 2010, multiple felonies, um, including uh, possessing stolen goods. Uh, if you go back to 2003, he's got a felony involving uh, a, a weapon of mass destruction, yep. which the uh, AP describes this way. Um, a 2002 yep. arrest for eluding a traffic stop and barricading himself from officers with a fully automatic machine gun and a, quote, weapon of mass destruction, which turned out to be an explosive with a 10 inch long fuse. So like some homemade dynamite or something. Yeah. And then more than 100 stolen items from power tools and building supplies to kayaks and spa tubs. 
uh, and then we all, it, he never went to prison for any of this. Yep. Uh, he went, he got probation, which the, the reason that raises red flags for people just to spell it out is that then you think, okay, did he cut some sort of deal? Is, does he have some sort of relationship with at some level of government? And then Kid. he's got all these, you know, he's a pro Ukraine, um, fanatic. Yep. He was like, uh, recruiting people from Pakistan to go fight in Ukraine. Uh, he wrote a self-published book. Uh, this led Edward Snowden to tweet, we know little so far, but uh, with alleged Trump shooters' personal and public participation in military activity in Ukraine, it's hard to imagine the White House's agencies can claim zero contact, quote, clean hands, something of an Oswald vibe here. Congress should get answers. Yep. Um, Knowing firsthand how the federal machinery operates, like how open minded or skeptical should we be about what's being implied here? Well, I, I think I'd be remiss if I said you should be anything but skeptical, right? We until yeah. you can conclusively tell me otherwise, I've got to assume that this guy is is some sort of um asset of the federal hey. government. Maybe he is, maybe he's oh. not. I have I have I have had not I haven't had any access to any documentation or conversation that, that tells me that he is. But yeah. given the gravity of what happens here, you can't take anything off the table, right? You've got to run out every possible investigative lead you've got here. Keep in mind, look, I, I've seen that arrest history. This guy's as big a nut job as any you'd ever run across, right? He runs the full gamut of activities to include this guy was too crazy for the Ukrainians. Right. He went over right. there to fight and they said, oh, this guy's too much of a nut. Here's a ticket. Get out of here. Go back to where you came from. Right. The guy sat in a bunch of bushes for at least 12 hours that we know of. He was camped out. Uh, yet, surprisingly, when he's spotted by a Secret Service agent and he's got to be thinking, OK, here comes the Secret Service. Trump can't be too far behind. He moves that rifle into position. He gets spotted and what just drops the rifle and leaves. And then when mm -hmm. he stopped on the road. He kind of just surrenders himself and gives up, you know, really doesn't put up a fight, which is a little unusual given this guy's uh, arrest uh, history and his track record here. And he doesn't really seem upset that he got caught, which leads me to ask, how do I know this wasn't some sort of test run and somebody put him up to this and said, hey, when mm -hmm. Trump approaches on the golf course, if you have a clear shot, take it. If not, Let's see what the Secret Service is going to do. And at some point, you know, you probably won't go to jail because he hasn't gone to jail the 40 times prior. Um, it, we don't know that. And I've mentioned that before. And some people say, Rich, you're a little crazy here with this. Maybe I am, but you've got to run out every possible lead because you don't know what you've got here yet because there's no information. That's yeah. how I would approach this. And I, and I hopefully that answers your, your question. No, it, it does. I think that, that it's that information vacuum that is the problem. Uh, it just, you know, it makes it 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 is sort of crazy making because you're like, right. th this is just such an unusual situation um, to have that level of contact and then um, to have just the normal secrecy that the federal government, yeah. especially the security agencies has. It opens up the the you know gets the the conspiracy wheels spinning um and again hopefully with the state in uh the state of florida involved we'll actually get Quick. some of that information and um we'll keep an open mind to which way the evidence yeah. actually points but um to start to wrap this up i want to ask you um from the secret service perspective is there any hope of you know writing this ship like what should happen to the secret service if you know uh rich staropoli is uh, suddenly appointed C uh, head of secret service what are the changes that need to be made to make this an effective and trustworthy organization again well listen i i, I think the big thing is here the minute that first shot was fired you've got to be prepared for a, another incident to occur right this doesn't just stop and you've got to be thinking, OK, we've had two. There's going to be a third, whether it's on Trump or a family member. You know, okay. that's anyone's guess at this point. Um, but the entire leadership of the Secret Service has to go. Right. We've got to immediately replace these people. Get me people from the field that are competent enough and that are not, um, you know, mired in complacency, that are committed to doing this job 
and getting the Secret Service back. If you do nothing other than restore the basics, you're leaps and bounds ahead of where we are. And that's where I would start with this thing. The other side of the house, the business side of the house, fire every one of these people. They have proven they are not capable of managing the budget, the $4 billion budget, as well as managing the logistics that's needed to move the manpower and resources as Trump bounces from site to site to site. Many of these sites, by the way, are fixed sites, so those assets can remain in place. Uh, but It just simply isn't getting done. That's where you got to start. Because all these things the director's talking about, you know, we're going to build this division and that division, that doesn't deal with the immediate um, thing. The, the protection doesn't stop because there's one or two incidents occurred. We've got to do things right now. And that's where I would do this. Let me ask you the final question of the show, right? which is what is a question that you think more people should be asking? I, I think the biggest question people can ask is how is it that an agency uh, that's one of 23 agencies under the Department of uh, Homeland Security can, can continually be afforded the courtesy, and that's what this is, of providing no answers, and in many cases, simply vague answers that make no sense, and yet no. the media is not up in arms about this. Why does nobody question the, the nonsensical answers that a government employee is given, given the gravity and monumentality of these situations? Yeah. Um, accountability in general, just the lack of it for yeah. our government officials over the past, you know, five or seven or eight years has been really stunning. And this is, you know, pro perhaps the most extreme and, and notable example of that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, hopefully uh, we will start getting some of that information soon and we'll cover it more on the show uh, as that comes out. I want to thank you, uh, Rich Staropoli, thank for you. joining us today on Just Asking Questions. Well, thank you very much, sir. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to Just Asking Questions. These conversations appear on Reason's YouTube channel and the Just Asking Questions podcast feed every Thursday. Subscribe wherever you get your podcasts and please rate and review the show.